Tracy Northcott, welcome to the Tokyo Living Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's a real pleasure on this uh, on this lovely Monday morning. Yes, absolutely. Um, you're a person I've been wanting to get on for for a long time now. Uh, I think you've got uh, obviously a long history in Japan and uh, a really unique story of how you've sort of taken advantage of a lot of different sort of business opportunities out here. Uh, perhaps if you could start by giving the listeners and the viewers uh, just a bit of background about yourself. Sure thing, mate. Um, I'm Australian, as you can hear from my uh, from my accent. Um, I've been in Japan 22 years um, as um, you know as as an entrepreneur. I um, I joined my brother, who's been here 35 years. I think he's been here. Um, so he he came, he arrived here when he was 19. So and he's now in his mid 50s. So. Basically, his whole adult life is here, and pretty much my whole adult life has been here too. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, you know, my background before I left Australia, I'm actually a trained chemist, which is quite random. Uh, and I was working in medical research and in biotech in, yeah. in Australia. And, and I kept blowing myself up. I was a really bad scientist. I was a really bad scientist. I used to blow myself up and, you know, and like, you know, mix reagents wrong and. <laughs> <laughs> it was really bad. Um, and, and so I retrained in IT. I retrained as a, like a um, project manager for IT okay. because my brother was running the software company in Japan. And he said, look, you know, it's a family business. Why don't you come join me? And I went, oh, well, you know, I was in my 20s. And it was, you know, um, I thought I'll be up for an adventure a couple of years away. And that was 22 years ago. <laughs> wow. Wow. And so... Yeah, and and so you, I guess you you originally working with your brother in that IT company. Um, I still am still am. We we we're a, like he's the main engineer, so he's the main coder, and we make um, and I do like I do the admin, and I do a lot of the you know running the company and and do the customer support and testing. I do some coding. Um, it's glorified text editing, if I'm honest. Um, but it's uh, so our our we make apps for. Um, mobile phones, so iPhones. So when we've been doing that for a long time, so we may, mainly make dictionaries and language learning apps, um, and it's really just it just chugs along and it, it it you know pays the bills and pays the rent, and then it allows us to do more interesting things that we're we're passionate about. So it just allows us to the freedom to you know uh, you know to go and do do our other projects. Yeah. And um, out of interest, I mean, uh, 22 years ago, there was no such thing as an iPhone. Um, and the word app um, probably had a completely different meaning back then. Um, it, what was your brother originally doing with the, the company in that space? Was it more sort of PC apps? or what, what, how did, And how did that sort of transition? Um, did, did you guys get in fairly early once the whole smartphone revolution came along? Sure. Well, originally he was uh, doing shrink wrap software, so in software shops, um, and doing language, so conversion apps, so um, fonts, input methods, front end processes, um, mainly for the desktop publishing world. So this is in the early days of Mac, where um, uh, where all of the sort of desktop publishing was really going onto Mac and. Then we were the Japan distributor for the Newton, which was a mobile device. Um, it was the first PDA, like personal digital assistant. And we were the Japanese distributor so that we brought in the hardware, put in the soft, put in our software and then shipped that to stuff to stores. Um, and that obviously was the precursor to, um, so the Newton OS really was the precursor to a lot of these other mobile operating systems. So we were originally Newton, then, you know, this is really getting really geeky. So if anyone's listening, is really into this stuff. So um, it was Newton. And then we got into the Scion, um, which was Epoch, which was a type of, um, uh, a type of, again, mobile operating system, which was used in Nokia phones um, and the handheld assistants from the Scion, which became Symbian. Um so we outlived. So we outlived the Newton. We outlived the Symbian and the Scion, and we outlived Nokia. We had a lot of work with Nokia here in the day. Um, I was actually contracted at one point into Nokia to do testing okay. um, and uh, language learning, like so language uh, display. So getting English devices to run in Japanese. 
Um, cause a lot, a lot of them, you know, of course they were designed in America. They weren't thinking about Asia. They weren't thinking about Asian u- users. Um, obviously things are different now because, you know, you turn on, you, you know, you turn on Netflix, right. And you can choose all your languages, but mm. 20 years ago, it was, you know, if you didn't speak English, then you were, you know, you had a very difficult time using consumer devices. Yeah. So sure. Trying to, try to bridge that gap. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm. And, uh, and what sort of, so you said that at the moment, the, the company's um, mainly focused on apps for sort of dictionary and, and, and those sort of products. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we do lots of, you know, we're, we're language geeks. Uh, you know, I did Japanese at high school. So I studied, I was studying Japanese from the age of 12. I'm still, I, I have enough Japanese to get me into trouble and not enough to get me out. <laughs> um, because, you know, I'm, my husband's Australian and we speak English at home. Um, so I sort of got to a point in my language and I just, you know, I'm not that much of a kanji, even though I work with kanji on a dating right. basis, I'm not, it doesn't give me pleasure to, to really right. level up my, my language skills. I work with it. Um, my brother, however, is he writes, he writes dictionaries in Japanese. So right. he's a complete kanji otaku. Um, and, you know, he's contributed a lot to sort of the edict, which is the, you know, the free version of the Japanese language databases. So we use a lot of that because uh, we helped write half of it. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of kanji learning and we also work with big dictionary manufacturers and we license their databases and, and, um, and push, push them out through the app store. Mm. So yeah, we, we were one of the first on the app store um, when the iPhone came out in 2008. Yeah. Uh, and that's just been, you know, that's just been paying our bills since then. Yeah. And we, we've just got, you know, we've, we've just got apps and we look after them and they're popular. And so, you know, there's um, an app people might know called Sakura, like, which is a, you know, there's a, it's a combination of, of, of uh, word to word dictionary as well as a kanji learning, as well as a kanji learning app. Okay. Okay. Mm. Um, and then when did you sort of start to pivot into other sort of business interests? <laughs> Oh, I've always, we've always had side hustles. We've yeah. always had side hustles. It's like, you know, I just want to do everything. I want to be everything. I want to play with everything. And, yeah. and when I first joined, you know, my brother said to me, look, this is a company. It's not a baby. Use it. Right. If you want to do something fun, if you want to, you know, use the company because it's, you know, use the tax structure, use the, it, use the resources that we've got in. And if you want to, um, and also the way it's been set up is that, when we did the incorporation, the Kabushigeisha, we ticked all the boxes. As in, when you incorporate a company, you've got to say, like, you've got to say what your intention is, what sort of business that you're going to be doing. Yeah. And we ticked, whenever we set up a company, it's set up, we tick all the boxes. Yeah. We want to be involved in travel and tourism. We want to be involved in, in transport and in, like, hospitality and restaurants. So we have the framework mm-hmm. um, which allows you to then pivot into you know if you've got a little project that has a you know is an arc it's got a start a middle and an end let, let's do it and we've done that a number of times yeah um and it's just you know because some things you get really interested in you do it and then you have fun with it you make money and then you close it down yeah. so you just it's like this serial entrepreneur based on your interest levels and as you grow and as world changes and um you know you can't keep doing the same thing every day it gets a bit stale and dull yeah for sure so, and when did you sort of discover that uh, entrepreneurial spirit? I mean, were your parents uh, as entrepreneurs or when did that sort of start for you? Well, it's funny. My, par- my parents, who are, I absolutely adore, they, they basically said, you know, we, they started off as working class. My mum grew up on a dairy farm in, in Queensland. My father came out from the UK as a 10-pound farm um, and they had like not, you know, brass razu to, to, to say, but they, you know, just through, you know, buying and selling real estate and just uh having some good you know plans in place Mm. um they just you know they said education is everything never stop learning never stop growing um and you know don't lock yourself in i I clearly remember this conversation with my father he said you know because at one point i wanted to be a doctor i wanted to go into medicine and he said look don't lock yourself into anything you don't know what your second act is going to be, your third act is going to be, your fourth act is going to be. So give yourself the flexibility to um, to pivot. I, I don't think he used those exact words, but that was the theme. Um, and because he'd had a number of jobs over his life um, and he had very little education. 
but it was just all like, you know, uh, got to feed the family. So mm -hmm. you do what you've got to do. Um, yeah. And I guess that's where I learned it from. And mum's just been always like a teacher, very steady, you know, smart with money um, and just just wanted us to be happy, wanted us to have the freedom of choice, which is the, which is the gift um, I'm grateful for on a daily basis. Yeah. Can you remember your first side hustle? What was the first sort of thing you branched into? Actually, my first side hustle was when I was like eight or nine years old. I used to sell cans. I used to collect up like aluminium cans and sell them to the yeah. recycling center. Um, that was my first side hustle. Um, in Japan, my first side hustle was probably we opened a bar in Golden Guy. Okay. Um, it was an Australian wine bar. This is well before the tourist boom. And, uh, it's still there now. We, you know, we sold it. Um, but, so, uh, you know, we started up this Aussie wine bar and, um, you know, in those days, golden guy really was just a whole bunch of, you know, actually not even massive amount of people just, you know, sitting at the bar drinking for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. Um, and I was, I tried to open up the markets like, well, you know, let's, you know, this is a hidden gem of, uh, of Japanese culture. So. I got it listed on Lonely Planet and I got it listed on Google Travel and, and then it hit the tourist boom and you should see Golden Go now. It's just full of, full of foreigners. Mm -hmm. So tourists, it's always on the bucket list of things to do. Yeah. So that was me. I did that. I hope wow. Well. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. And how, how was that sort of getting um, into the hospitality industry, uh, coming from yeah the, the software um, world that you're working in? Um obviously that must have been a massive learning experience. Yeah. I'm, look, I'm just a constant learner. I mean, I did, you know, all the way through uni, I was, you know, working in, um, I was working in department stores. I was working in cafes, you know, so always sort of uh, had a connection with the general public. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, and then my husband, who we're, we weren't married at the time, um, he comes from a restaurant background, food beverage. And uh, so, you know, he was running a bar as well. So yep. that was for his visa, basically. So Yeah. Okay. And did you meet your husband out here? I did. I did. It's a, it's a bit of a funny story. It's like you go to a different country and you, uh, you, you meet another Australian and you get married and have children and build a house. It's crazy. Um, I, was, I am friends with his sister. And okay. so she'd been living here for a number of years as an English teacher. And we used to hang out on weekends and go to bars and pick up boys and, you know, like go, you know, go to bands and just do the things that 20 something women do. Um, and, uh, you know, we also had a lot of common interests. We did a lot of sewing and creative projects and, um, just, just fun things together. Um, and she said, Oh, my little brother has been in London and he's coming over for three months on his work because he's finished his working holiday in London and he's coming back through. Um, and that's where we met. So, well, yeah. So oh, yeah. That, he stayed. She went back to she went back to Australia, and um, and he stayed. Mm. Wow. So uh, Aussie girl comes out to Japan to work with her brother, meets another Aussie, and then they get married and uh, build a house and have kids. It almost sounds like someone. Almost sounds like some. Uh, anyway. <laughs> it it wasn't it wasn't planned. It was just you know I'm of the belief I don't I never have these sort of long long five year plans ten year plans. It's just do the next right thing, do yeah. the next, do the you know follow follow what you know follow the things that are available to you and do what makes you happy and uh, you know just yeah. I mean the, the the biggest plan we've made is to build a house. I mean now we've got like a thirty year mortgage, so it's like yeah. yeah. Being being adults, being grown up, mm. and uh, I guess it's a good sort of segue into how you got involved in that Airbnb space. Um, did you uh, were you sort of uh, involved in that, um, or did you have the vision of that when you were building the house, or did you? Um, how did that happen? Uh, I started ten years ago when it, I took a took a trip to Korea, and. We were looking for a house that would fit all of us, like, you know, my parents and my brother and his family. And it was really hard to find something that was, um, uh, that was suitable for all of us to, um, to stay in. And someone mentioned this Airbnb thing. I thought, oh, okay. So we rented a house, um, in Korea so that we could all hang out. 
And this is when my son was just a like really, really infant, um, really small. And like mind blown, it was like, okay, well, this is what's needed in Japan. Like, because we've got all these guests coming to see us now that we've got this small child. Um, and you know, what, you know what Japan apartments are like. They're really, you know, really not conducive to have the in-laws sleeping on the futon in the living room for mm. you know, more than a day or so. So, um, and so I thought, well, I'd already be, we'd all, one of the side hustles that my brother had had was a real estate company. Okay. Uh, so um, we were already involved in real estate and sort of leasing and and uh, this is, again, a, one of the side hustles. Um, and so we already had a little bit of experience in the real estate side. I love real estate. I love looking at floor plans. Um, I, you know, I go through Sumo all the time and just, mm-hmm. and, you know, just dream about different properties. Um, I, I don't read fashion magazines, though. <laughs> like house magazines yeah um and uh, so we're just able to um thought well okay this is it this is 2011 or t- 2012 um and so i i went to a real estate agent and uh I, you know said look went to an owner three real estate agent and said look i want a second house second house sitter that i can have family and friends go and stay and i just rented a small you know a small studio uh, right near my place where we could put family and friends and I thought, well, if I can rent it out 50% of the time, I've really just covered my cost. That was the goal. I just wanted it to be a, I just wanted it to be a zero sum game mm. and not be a cost center for me. Um, and then it just went bonkers. Like, you know, tourism was just, just went nuts. And it was like, oh my goodness. Like I didn't realize there was such demand. And I really enjoyed it and I really enjoyed the cash flow. Like the cash flow was just crazy. Mm. So then I rented another one and then another one and then another one. Um, and then started working with people who owned houses who only used them part time. Um, you know, maybe they, you know, had uh, a business overseas and they, you know, there's a lot of people who are like that, who are fairly transient. They want a base um, and, uh, you know, they own the house. Um, and they, you know, you know, want someone to look after it while they're away. Because I mean, if when you have an Airbnb, they're cleans mm. so much better than a long term rental. Like, mm. you know, you know, when you've got a short term rental, how often they're cleaned and and how well they're maintained because you have to. Yeah. Um, if you're a, if you're a professional host, if you're doing this seriously, then yeah, you you really do keep up with the maintenance. Um, and for an owner, that's a for an owner who is partly overseas and partly you know in in tokyo that's uh that's a really interesting um opportunity because they can come back and use their own home while they're in town and then they know the mortgage is paid and and uh everything's taken care of and the garden's being looked after so yeah. um yeah. What were the, i just out of interest um what were sort of legal implications and, and has that changed since then in terms of being able to rent a place and then sublet it uh, as an Airbnb? Very much so. So we, this was 2000 and tw- like I said, 2012. Um, it went like it just went bonkers between then and, um, you know, when regulations came in in 2000. They, they finally kicked in in 2018. But they were like they were they were going through the parliament um, being hashed out between the ward officers and the, and the federal government for a long time. Um, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of cowboys. Um, there are a lot of people doing things badly. Um, no. There are a lot of people who were, you know, lying to their landlords. There were a lot of people who were, you know, trying to sneak people in and, and then overfilling. There were a lot of people doing it really badly because the cash was just, the cash was mad. Uh, so uh, so we made a decision very early on that we were going to not overfill, that we were really specific about who the type of guests we were targeting. And we saw our job as providing the, the, the information for guests to behave well. And uh, our guests are the ones who really want to have a local experience. They want to behave well. So we give them the tools to, to succeed and the tools to thrive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and I think a lot of people were just thinking, oh, I'll just you know chuck up something and it's passive income. Like when you when you're serious about running a short term rental business, it's not passive. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot of money. It's not like long term. It's like it's not passive. You yeah. really have to. It's it's 
and it's not a real estate job. It's a hospitality job. So you yep. really have to look after guests um, and have really good systems in place. Um, yeah. And there was a there was a lot of pushback from the from the from the market and a lot of pushback from local communities because there were some people doing doing some dodgy things. Yeah. Um, and was that the main thing that sort of drove those regulations coming into play, or was it uh, also the hotel industry um, pushing back as well? I, I look, I can only speculate. I mean, mm. around the world, obviously, it happened at the same time where it, this is just wasn't you know unique to Japan, right. um, but around the world, obviously, it, you know, this uh, opportunity exploded um, with. Um, uh, the you know the opportunity exploded for for people around the world to go and stay in houses. So, um, uh, so that there are regulations coming into place everywhere. Um, so again, so it's not unique to Japan, but it it did make sure that things were you know done well uh, in terms. So what we have to do for our regulations is that we have to make sure that we've got all the safety equipment in place, that we've got all the fire extinguishers, they're checked on a regular basis. Um, all the things that you would expect when when you're looking after someone where they sleep, it's a it's it's a big responsibility because um, uh, yeah, people are very vulnerable when they sleep. So you know you can't just sort of set up a slumlord situation. You've got yeah. to you've got to really take care of um, people's care, safety, and also your neighbourhood responsibilities. And the regulations were really just to put in place that that framework for people who who didn't. <laughs> Who weren't thinking about that, right? Um, okay, we were already doing a lot of the things that were on the regulations before right. the regulations came out. Um, so for us, it was quite it was quite an easy decision to spend the money and the time to get the licenses. Yeah, so, yeah, we're fully licensed. Yeah, yeah, um, and so that didn't negatively affect your business. Like it, it, there weren't sort of limits on um, the you know, occupancy and things that that would have affected the way that you're running before. There was a big change. So. Before 2018, we had like 28, 29 units under management. Um, and so we took out this, like, well, I took out this big planning sheet and I went, okay, well, regulations are coming in, looking at the, the address, which ones are going to be viable, which ones are weren't. So we started closing down the ones that were not going to be viable when the new re- regulations kicked in. Um, and so then we focused on a smaller number of uh, listings but the ones that were really generating the highest profit for yeah. the least amount of time. Yeah. And so we refocused on to houses, um, standalone houses, and we don't have any in apartments anymore. Okay. Um, so, yeah, standalone houses, families, that's who we target, that's who we host. You know, if it's a, if it's a group of Aussies coming in for a ski trip or, you know, a group of students, we're, we're not your host. Um and there's there's other people that will fit, fill that need. So we vet our guests really well, and we nurture them, and um and it's it's a good relationship. And also we work with the communities. So that's the other thing I've p- really put into place is that I've got relationships with the the local yaki yaki tori guy and the the local shopkeepers and the local restaurant owners, and they love me because I'm sending them new business. Yeah, and so it's not like. I don't have to walk around like, you know, oh my goodness, I'm feeling like a criminal. It's like, I'm proud of what we do. We do a good job. We, you know, we offer a fantastic service for inbound tourists. We give them experiences that they're, they're not going to get at a hotel. Yeah. Um, my product is not cheap accommodation. I don't just provide a bit. I provide you with a local experience based on what I know, what it's like to live here as a non-Japanese person in a community. So that's, that's our product. Yeah. Um, so my product, like I said, it's it's not. I don't just. I don't offer cheap accommodation. I offer you a bed, but that's a, only a part of the total experience. Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, I guess fast forward a couple of years to twenty twenty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, that would have affected your your business massively. Um, how did you sort of pivot then, and and did you sort of you know move into other markets after that? Yeah, well, um, so 20, 2018, you know, obviously we set up the, the, uh, you know, we were done as we were set up as a professional host. Then what I was doing was I was doing some consulting on the side. I was doing, I was teaching other hosts, especially Japanese hosts on how to 
set up, how to get licensed, how to how to look after inbound tourists. Because a lot of Japanese people, you know, were thinking, oh, look, I'll just I'll just put a couple of teacups and some hashi. It's like, no, when you're like inbound, like if your market is inbound tourists, you need to understand their needs. And so that was what I was doing. I was educating and setting up, helping Japanese hosts set up for for the inbound tourists. And I was having that on the side a little bit um, throughout 2018 and 2019. Um, and we were all set for 2020 in terms of our actual hosting business. And we had a number of properties that were all fully booked out. Um, you know, this was going to be our, you know, we were, we had a number of properties that we were only going to be managing until September, October of 2020 that we're, you know, that we're under contract that we were going to give them back. And, and yeah, so we were all set up for the Olympics <laughs> and then. Yes, we know what happened. Um, and yeah, I spent I spent a lot of time sitting on the living room floor in the fetal position, just like going, "What has just happened?" Um, it was a real shock to the nervous system. Um, I was in denial. I was in like you know, it, I had a breakdown. It was not. It was not pretty. I won't lie. Yeah, I can imagine. Because um, that was you know. With my husband working in the business as well and a massive mortgage, we were all in. Mm. And we just, every day, we just saw the bookings like, you know, we lost a million dollars in a matter of weeks. Mm. And it was just real. Like when you're a small business owner, when you've got no safety net, mm. it was oh, we, no real safety net that I thought of at the time. It was just really hard. Um, plus as well, we didn't know what this thing was, right? We we're all yeah. in the same position. Like, you know, are we all going to get sick and die? That that was the, the pressure as well, um, as well as oh my goodness, how am I going to fit? How how are we going to feed ourselves? So yeah, so that was that was hard. Those that first six months of um, of twenty twenty were hard, and homeschooling and yeah, yeah, um, yeah, just and it was just really one foot in front of the other, and the news every day was changing. So I started writing. Um, I found it really helpful for my mental for, for my mental health and uh, and also for planning just to start writing. Um, and I started writing a blog and I started to uh, write. Um, I wrote a book, like a like a chapter of a book, um, and I just was writing. Um, it was really helpful, really helpful therapy. And um, and then I started. Uh, then I took that consulting business that I started that I was doing for Japanese folks, I actually took that online and I pivoted then to a global audience. Um, the US market for short-term rentals was going bonkers. It was, real estate was going mad. Um, the local demand for travel in, internally of the US was just mad. Um, and so there was a lot of people getting into short-term rentals um, and I was helping them and charging them a fee of how to do it. So. Yeah. Um, so that's been, so I've been consulting uh, a lot um, over the last uh, two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's been my pivot. Yeah. And uh, I believe you're featured in a, in a book as well. Yes, I was. Yes. Um, which, um, which I think is may become, may become something in Netflix. I'm not quite sure. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Netflix are doing everything right now, so it's a good possibility. <laughs> Who knows? So, um, really? yeah, the the publishers are working together with that. So, yeah, that was my story. Um, there was hosts from all over the world, and our stories of short term rental and and um, how what our what our views of hospitality is, and how we approach how we approach our businesses. Yeah. So, oh, very cool. Yeah. And uh, and so now, as things are, you know, hopefully uh, starting to open up a little, um, are you seeing some sort of bookings start to, to come back in? How how, is, how have you seen the business sort of um, start to pick up? Uh, are things starting to move in the right direction? Do you feel, or is it starting to? So the people that were supposed to be coming in twenty twenty, so these are people who were. Fulbright scholars, for example, mm. like traveling professors on 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 uh, on sabbatical, people that were supposed to be relocating for work 
um, they're finally in, they're finally coming in. So that's been, that's been like bread and butter, uh, in the host. So, um, for the houses, for the hosting business, um, it's been my bread and butter for the last, you know, year, um, since they started letting business people and students and, and back in. So, uh, tr- tourists are not still as a, I'm not sure when this is airing, but, um, you tomorrow. know, tomorrow, <laughs> they're still, maybe, not, <laughs> maybe, no. well, they're still not, they're still not allowed in without certain restrictions. I mean, there's a few things that people are doing. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it's not like 2019 where you could just jump on a plane and land. Um, it is starting. It is starting. I'm getting a lot of inquiries. People are booking, but they're, they're very tentative, um, which is crazy. It just drives me nuts because in terms of all of the, the countries around the world that used to have waivers, I think Japan is still the only country that, is, um, that, that puts a lot of hoops that you have to jump, like, jump through to get your visa like as a as a as a tourist um which is mad because it's putting so much strain on the consulate workers around the world um yeah. so i feel for those japanese you know bureaucrats who are working in you know working in foreign uh working in foreign embassies because they just slams they're absolutely slams yeah so i mean what we're saying with we shrank our portfolio and that was the first thing we did yeah. in 2020. We went from like 25 and, you know, we're, we're really down to bare bones. Um, and I've got a ton of furniture and storage. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like waiting because I can't, you know, obviously I, I can't afford to go into a, a new rental um, or a new opportunity until these borders are fully open because that yeah. would just be, that would just be irresponsible for yeah. me. <laughs> Um, as much as I love setting up houses and I love like, you know, uh, doing the business, I, when the, you know, when my, when my, when my supply is not there, it's just, it's just, that's not good, not prudent. Um, it's not, and the thing is, I don't understand it. It's not a lot of domestic appetite for, um, house rentals in Japan. So, and, um, you know, like the average Japanese family is not renting a a house um yeah they go to the orkans or they're going to you know they're going to onsen resorts um because there's just so many and that you know in japan they're just so good um i understand that um but in terms of house rentals it's just it's there's, there's no domestic appetite as such yeah yeah um and i guess uh, for the future uh obviously yeah we're uh, um, we wish you all the, the, the best in terms of things opening up and you uh, being able to build back uh, up to where you were and, and, and hopefully sort of push beyond that. But uh, have you got any other uh, any other plans, any other sort of side hustles that uh, you're working well, on? Yeah, my husband, like, you know, because my husband has just been killing it lately. He's Because, uh, you know, like I said, we were all in the business. Um, and then, you know, I had my software business and then I had my consulting and he was kind of at a loose end. And we were looking at getting him a food truck at one point um, because he's he's from like the restaurant business um, mm. in the past. But, you know, as a, you know, as a non-Japanese person running a food truck, there's a, that, there was a lot of unknowns and variables. And especially during the pandemic, it was like, oh, what are we going to do? But what he's done actually is he's bought a, um, He's bought a cake truck and he now has a moving business um, and he's killing it. He's, do- he's in demand. He's doing a great job. So he does basic handyman stuff and, uh, and moving. Um, and there's, uh, he's busy every day. He's turning down work. Um, wow. So it's, uh, you know, because he's got a little truck. He can like zip in and out. And um, a lot of people who buy and sell, um, a lot of people who buy and sell or, you know, they need disposals or they're leaving the country or they're coming into the country. And so there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of like, um, between, between non-Japanese and non-like Japanese. It's like, there's a, there's a big trade going on and he's there, he's there as the, and no one has cars, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, you know, you can't, you know, you can't carry a desk. If you bought a new desk, you can't carry it on the train. So, um, he's, he's meeting that need because he's got the small truck. He's a, you know, it's a reasonable price. So yeah, 
So. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, we're always looking to those uh, little opportunities. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what we do. And what about you guys? I mean, how, I mean, you must have had a, you've had a rough time with the, you know, you know, being in a face to face business. So. For sure. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess the, the worst part of it was that we opened up our second, uh, full-time location, uh, in January, 2020. Um, yeah. so yeah, that timing couldn't have been worse, but, um, yeah, but we've been really lucky that, um, we've managed to sort of stay afloat and we've, uh, um, kept busy enough to you know, keep all our staff on and, um, uh, and you can get through this and yeah, before the summer, we, we had our, um, busiest week, uh, on record. Um, in terms of uh, numbers, people in the facility or between the two facilities, but obviously we've got still got this um, overhead of a, a second location um, that uh, that we need to factor in. So we're, we're still you know operating at a, a loss compared to where we were before. But um, yeah, with the, all the new people, um, I guess for us, yeah, yeah we're not not um, uh, relying on uh, tourists as you are, and and there's a lot of new people coming into Tokyo to work um, who've been waiting for. Two Wait, years to get yeah, here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the expat uh, population now is sort of really turning over. And as you know, all the schools, international schools are back last week. So, um, even just last week, we had a, a massive sort of upturn in, in business. So I think it's a really exciting time. There's a lot of, uh, um, new people coming into the country and, um, we really want to capitalize on that. And we spent the, the last two years. Uh, trying to optimize our business and, and work on things to try and make sure that when things do return back to normal, we're, we're in an even better position to um, serve the people we want to and, and working on uh, other new opportunities. Like you, I'm always trying to think about different things to do. And yeah, we've um, built an online um, bilingual um, fitness education site that we've just launched and been working on a um, an online economics program and uh, things like that. So we've always been um, working on other things to sort of complement the the main services we offer. But uh, mm. yeah, it's, it's been tough, um, but we have been lucky we've had the support of our, our clients and, um, uh, and and our referrers and our network and uh, we've managed to get through and, and excited for sort of what the next um, 12 months offers. And families. Honestly, I think your, oh, business, sure. are, your business and my business are fairly similar in that we're, we're sort of really – you know, we've got everyone working, really, brothers and sisters and, and uh, you know, husbands and wives and all sorts yeah. of things. So, and it's, and having that, having that network is just, it, it's just been so wonderful. I don't think we would have got through without being able to lean on each other. Um, For sure. And uh, yeah, I think I see you guys doing the same, same sort of thing as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess if people want to find out a little bit more about you, we'll, we'll put all your, all your links in the show notes, all the different things you do. Uh, uh, I, I guess if people are interested more on the Airbnb side and, um, are thinking of maybe doing that, um, how would they get in touch with you from a consulting perspective? And also, um, what was the name of the, the book and soon to be, uh, Netflix, uh, <laughs> documentary? Well, it hasn't been picked up yet, but then they're like still in, still in discussions, I think. So. Um, so I mean, my, my, I'm really not hard to find. I'm not a woman of mystery. Um, my hosting business is actually Tokyo Family Stays. Um, so where we are and who we serve and what we do is built right into the marine. Um, and, uh, so we have our own properties in there. We also have properties that we manage for other people. And we also have properties that we market for other people. So they, they, are ones that, um, you know, they just need an additional marketing stream. Cause I, I do a lot of the, 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 the SEO and the, the marketing and the direct, um, the direct relationships with inbound, like relocation companies, for example. So I have all those relationships in place and I can sort of aggregate, um, aggregate other people's small businesses into, into the Tokyo family stay. So, um, I can do that. Um, I can also, you know, if people are interested in setting up their own short-term rental business. I can advise, um, on the steps you have to go through. Uh, and I do that on consulting basis. So it's Tracy Northcott consulting. So again, you know, nothing fancy in terms of the, the naming. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I write a blog on the, the Tracy Northcott consulting as well. And I talk about, you know, different types of hospitality and the, the duty of care and the things that I think are important uh, and not just the money, right? The money, the, obviously maximizing profits is, is really important, um, but you you do have, I, I believe you've got a real duty of care um, when you when you get into this business. It's not passive. 
um, if you don't have that time and you don't have that, you know, inclination, not everybody is designed, like not everyone should be a host. Mm-hmm. So if you still want the investment opportunity. That's totally great. Hook up with somebody who does have that in the, their own DNA of their business, which is like looking after people. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's, there's different ways that you can be involved in short-term rentals. You can be involved as, a, as an investor. You can be involved as a host. You can be involved um, as, as a hybrid of the two. You know, there's lots of ways that you could be involved in this new, it's, it's an, you know, it's, it's not even a new market anymore. It's been like, you know, renting out vacation rentals has been going out, going along for ages, for years and years and years. Um, but it's only now that it's sort of gone digital that um, people are sort of starting to, to think about it as, as real experience opportunities. So, um, and it's, it's like as a as a guest when you're coming into a city, um, you get so much more from living in a community than you would if you you know go and stay in a hotel. If you just want to stay in a hotel, that's fine. They're different products, and I that's what I stress. Yeah. Um, is there different experiences, and they're, they're, they're um, and people stay. Not everyone likes staying in, in Airbnbs. Or not everyone likes it. It's not for them, and that's that's totally fine as well. Yeah, it's some choice. Yeah, yeah, I love the choice. Yeah. Uh, and the name of the book, sorry. Uh... Hospitable Hosts. The Hospitable Hosts. Yes. So these are 40, there were 40 hosts from around the world. We all put together, we contributed a, a, a chapter. Awesome. Yeah. I'm writing another book as well, actually. Okay. Uh, it's called The the Wholehearted Host. Okay. So again, you can see, you know, it's not, not really a mystery about what it's going to be all about. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, just a plug for Ashley's removal business as well. Do you have a? Sure. It's Gold Star, uh, Gold Star Removals, or well, Gold Star Moving Services. But he's got his own page on the Tokyo Family Stays website. So Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and if you guys sort of active on social media, people? Like... I'm, I'm all over social media. I'm all over Facebook, all over Instagram. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm really, really not a woman of mystery. Okay. And if people um, just search uh, Tracy Northcote on um, those platforms, they'll be able to find you. Yeah. But you'll put them in the show notes, right? So Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, it was uh, even more of an interesting chat uh, than I thought it'd be. I learned a whole lot of new things about you. Um, really cool. Really cool um, to hear your story. And, uh, you know, Lani's always spoken very highly about you as a very sort of influential woman in the, the Tokyo business community here. So it was, uh, it was great to have you on and have a chat. Oh, thank you very much. It's been fun. It's been fun. All right. Thanks very much, Tracy. Thank you. Take care.